powered by the Montana Television Network. This is the 530 News on Q2, Montana's news leader. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Russ Riesinger. And I'm Janelle Slade. Coal Strip Units 1 and 2 will permanently close by the end of this year. That announcement expected but not anticipated quite so soon. As Talon Energy, the owner of the coal-fired plant in Coal Strip, announces its plans surrounding the closure and what's next. Now this announcement following previous plans to keep the units open another two and a half years. But in today's release, Talon Montana President Dale Lebsack blames financial challenges, specifically calling out out repeated failed efforts to negotiate lower fuel prices with Westmoreland Rosebud Mining. Today's release also states Talon will work to ensure the retirement process is orderly and minimizes the effect on its employees, community members, and other key stakeholders. Now, part of that plan will look to redeploy affected coal strip employees to help retire units one and two or help with the operation of units three and four. The company says the primary goal now is to ensure that coal strip units three and four remain economically viable a source of power to Montana and the Northwest. Well, today, Senator Steve Daines responding to the closure with scathing criticism. He says today's news is yet another example of the devastating impacts of extreme environmental regulations, fringe litigation, and partisan politics says it's truly disheartening to see units one and two be forced to close. And Senator John Tester says the abrupt closure is a surprise, but workers are top priority. He says, quote, I'll be working to make sure Talon isn't leaving workers out to dry and is keeping the community and employees informed about what they can expect in this process. And I'll be holding them accountable for a thorough cleanup of the site. Well, today's closure announcement comes as no surprise, but the startling reality that the shutdown will happen by the end of this year is catching people off guard. Q2's Jay Cohn joins us tonight to put today's news in some sort of perspective. Jay. Well, thanks, Janelle and Russ. You know, one has to wonder if the final chapter in this history of the coal strip power plants is being written right before our very eyes. When construction on the first two plants got underway back in the mid-1970s, it ushered it in a new era for Montana's energy sector. Now that era may be coming to an end. When coal strip units one and two first went online in 1975, the town of coal strip boomed, soaring from a population of 2,800 people to 8,000. And with plans in the works then to build two additional coal-fired plants, the town of Coal Strip's future was bright. The debate, though, ensued. Who would end up paying for the costly plants, whose price tag had ballooned from $500 million to $1.8 billion? Montana Power Company president at the time, Paul Schmeckel, sounded a familiar refrain, zeroing in on the affordability and dependability of Coal Strip power. You need electricity when you need it, and we can't issue a rain check and invite you back to pick up some kilowatt hours next week. Fast forward 44 years and that same argument was front and center during this year's 2019 legislative session. Lawmakers were considering the so-called Save Coal Strip Bill that would have allowed Northwestern Energy to purchase the plants for a single dollar. Again, affordable, dependable power was Coal Strip's calling card. But in the end, the votes weren't there and the bill failed. Billing Senator Tom Richmond, who sponsored the bill, says the closure announcement today was not unexpected, but says, quote, there's a big difference between anticipation and reality. And Coal Strip Senator Dwayne Acne says he shares the anger and disappointment over today's announcement. He vows to keep up the fight for the plant's future. He says his first concern is for the people who live and work in Coal Strip. Quote, our plant is our heart and I'll do anything and everything in my power to ensure it continues to beat strong. So it remains to be seen just how this electrical grid can absorb the loss of coal strip power uh, from one and two when they are set to close at the end of the year. That dependable power funnels much of it right into Billings where the two or the three refineries here in the medical corridor depends on that dependable power, if I can be redundant. So Senator Richmond says this transition to a new uh, uncertain future will be one to watch. Russ, do you know? All right, thank you, Jay. Well, the Billings Police Department tonight busy prepping for the vice president's arrival. Air Force Two is expected to land in Billings tomorrow around noon. Police Chief Rich St. John wants the public to know what to expect, which is heavy road delays and closures as the vice president and second lady move through town. Q2 Zoe Zandora was at today's press conference and is standing by now with those details. Zoe.
Yeah, it's going to be a busy day and really 24 hours for downtown Billings as Pence arrives around noon on Wednesday and he begins his day. Now he'll be starting with his first stop at Riverstone Health Center that's on South 27th Street. There will be a barricade made to allow Pence to get to his destination safely. Uniformed officers will be closing all intersections along South 27th until Pence arrives safely. Then he'll go to his next destination on the north side of the city. Again, same procedure. Officers will close down all intersections along the way until Pence's arrival. He will make one more stop after that to the West End before arriving here at the Doubletree around mid-afternoon. Now around 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning, several intersections here in downtown Billings will be closed for 24 hours. They will, however, be clearly marked by signs. The perimeter of the block of Doubletree will be closed for 24 hours to any vehicle Particular traffic, foot traffic will still be allowed. Now, anyone staying here at the Double Tree will be allowed in and out. You will have to go through a screening process. It's going to be a busy day and busy 24 hours while Vice President Mike Pence is visiting. And you can see they've already closed down the parking lot here at the Double Tree. We will keep you updated on air and online with all live coverage. Make sure you tune in. Back to you. All right, thanks so much, Zoe. And now as well tomorrow, look out for closures on I-90, I-90 westbound between the Lockwood exit and Zoo Drive will close as that motorcade passes by. And I-90 eastbound will close as the motorcade leaves Zoo Drive and returns to King Avenue. All of tomorrow's events are closed to the public. Well, the vice president, along with the second lady, will travel to Yellowstone National Park following their stop in Billings. Air Force Two is scheduled to arrive at Yellowstone Airport at 10 a.m. Thursday. The vice president will tour the park with current Secretary of Interior David Bernhardt. Now, Pence will stop at Old Faithful and give remarks about the Trump administration's support to rebuild national park infrastructure. Later that night, Pence will return to D.C. Well, the race for Montana's governor in 2020 has four prominent Republicans in the hunt, but no Democrats until now. Today, House Minority Leader Casey Schreiner of Great Falls announced his run for governor. The 36-year-old is a former teacher and currently works for the State Department of Labor. Schreiner says he's running to put the priorities of hardworking, everyday families first with an emphasis on affordable health care and education. The four Republicans already in the race, Attorney General Tim Fox, Congressman Greg Gianforte, State Senator Alof Shesky, and Secretary of State Corey Stapleton. And Montana State Superintendent of Public Instruction is officially launching her campaign for a second term. Elsie Arnson made that announcement today. The Republican from Billings says her top priority is to make sure students are ready for college or careers. Arnson previously worked as a teacher and served in the Montana legislature. Her announcement sets up a potential rematch of the 2016 election. Helena teacher Melissa Romano is again seeking the Democratic nomination for state superintendent. Arnson defeated Romano by three percentage points in 2016. Police have now identified a motorcyclist who was killed in a crash Sunday in Billings. 19-year-old Bulent Helvachi of Billings died following the collision with a pickup truck on Shiloh Road Sunday evening. Police say Helvachi ran into the front of that pickup truck that was making a left turn. The force of the impact throwing him off the cycle and killing the teenager, even though he was wearing a helmet at the time. No word on any, if any charges have been filed in that accident. Well, a busy Bozeman Road is open tonight after a semi-truck hauling more than 400 beehives crashed last night on the side of the road. Today, hundreds of bees, both dead and alive, still cover the roadway. Cody Boyer is there, bee stings and all, with the latest. It was a great, great ending to a, what could have been a, just a disaster. The first problem was easy to see. Swarms of bees covering the double tractor trailer on Durston Road last night. The occupants and drivers of the truck were very fortunate that they walked away uninjured. Steve Thorson, experienced beekeeper and owner of Montana Honey Bee Company, was called in to help. There was talk about bringing the fire department in and foaming them. Uh, I tried to talk him out of that and say, you know, let's try to save them if we can. Thorson says Mother Nature worked in their favor. It was a cool day. The other big thing was is when the truck was uprighted, it was almost dark. And when the bees are, when it's dark out, the bees are a lot more docile. Thorson adds, if you do the math, that's over 130 million bees altogether. About four pounds would be about 12,000. 
that's a lot. Apiarists like Steve say losing only a single pound of bees out of 40,000 is pretty amazing. That's only about 1,000 bees. There's 412 hives on that truck. I would be really surprised if more than two of them were damaged. And according to Thorson, they shouldn't have been driving there in the first place. They had no business being on Durston and Gooch Hill and uh, evidently they got uh, mixed up with Google Maps and they should have been going down Huffine. Gallatin County Sheriff Brian Gutkin agrees this could have been avoided. It's speed. You know, I mean, the whole idea is, is to drive safely, know, your, know what's in front of you, and to be driving accordingly. A few stings aside, he adds this could have ended a lot worse. We could have ended up killing millions and millions of bees yesterday. Didn't have to. Well, Thorson adds that cargo was worth more than $100,000 wow. and no one was in any danger during all of this. Now, despite what happened, the rest of the bees are back on their way to North Dakota. That's good. Well, coming up on tonight's 530 News, if you're itching for a solution to your chronic allergies, don't pull off this new potential treatment. We'll show you next. And in sports tonight, we find Q2's Athlete of the Week in the boxing ring. Scott shows us how she's battling through not one, but two heart issues. You're watching MTN News with Janelle Slade and Russ Riesinger. Storm Tracker Weather with Bob McGuire and Sports with Scott Breen. This is the 530 News on Q2, Montana's news leader.